Well, good morning, everyone. How are we? It is so good to be with all of you. I'm so excited. Again, my name is Ryan. I am not Cliff. Uh, I know some of you were like, he shaved his mustache. He looks shorter. No, like I am a new guy. I am a new guy and excited to be with all of you. I know we still have a ways to go, but my family and I, we are starting to feel really settled in and, and making this place our home. We finally closed on our house in, in Michigan. All of that is sold and done with, and so we are excited about that. And we move into our new home in just a couple of weeks, uh, uh, August 13th. And so if any of you uh, are interested in helping your pastor move into his home, <laughs> we have a pre-service serve day on August 13th, and I heard you get like double your jewels in your heavenly crown if you help the pastor serve. So, so mark your calendars August 13th. I've been able to get settled into the office and spend some, some time with the staff, and it's just been so cool to hang out with them and get to know them a little bit better. Uh, good news is I think some of them like me, which notice I said I think and some, the verdict is still out on all of that, but, but it really is good to be settled in because um, uh, contrary to popular opinion, moving is not the most fun thing in the world. It's just not, don't let that deter you from helping me in a couple weeks, but, but it, it's, it's difficult and not just the physical moving of stuff, but, but all the details that surround moving and all the moving parts, so to speak. You know what I'm talking about? All those moving parts and so much of it just seems like it's outside of your control when you're doing it. And, and with it comes this sense of uncertainty. And, and no one likes uncertainty, right? No one likes uncertainty. Like, for example, back in April and May when Carrie and I, when I accepted this role to be your new lead pastor, um, we began to, like, work on our house and clean it up and fix it up and we got our realtor on board and we listed it on the marketplace and we did all of those things, all of those things that are kind of seemingly under your control. But there's so much around it that was still outside of our control. Like we couldn't control who was going to come look at our house. We couldn't control, control when they were going to look at it. Or, or especially we couldn't control if they were going to actually buy it. And so we just waited and waited, right? Tons of fun. So much uncertainty surrounding that. And like I said, no one likes uncertainty. Or I think about like this whole situation right now with us and me and Arbor and this role as your new pastor. And I can read all about Arbor on the website and I can watch your previous services and your search committee and your elder board can read my resume and watch my previous messages and we can have all of these conversations and we can talk and we can pray and we can seek outside counsel and we can make the decision to be like, yeah, we think this is going to be a good fit that honors God and glorifies God. But, but let's be honest, even surrounding all of this, there's some uncertainty, isn't there? Yeah? There's some uncertainty, and none of us like uncertainty. Or maybe an example that might even hit closer to home. Can we just talk about the Seahawks this year? No. Pete, Pete we, we're going to do it, because Pete Carroll can do everything in his power to coach this team, but there's only so much you can do with either Geno Smith or Drew Locke as your <laughs> options, right? Amen. And so surrounding the Seahawks, there is a lot of uncertainty, right? A lot of uncertainty. Some of you might be like, no, there is no uncertainty. They are going to be terrible this year. <laughs> I respect that, okay? I respect that. Unmet expectations are often the source of our greatest disappointments. So I, I, can, I can absolutely, I'm a Bears fan. You know, we've never had a good quarterback in our franchise. We've had Jay Cutler, a great human being, but not a great quarterback, right? And I wish I could say it gets better, but listen, like I said, I'm a Bears fan. I, I don't know if it's gonna get better. It might be really bad for a long time, Seahawks fans. Just being honest. So uncertainty uncertainty. There is a certain uneasy feeling that comes along with uncertainty, isn't there? And it can be around those circumstances that I just shared, or it might rise from something more serious. Maybe uncertainty is rising up in your life surrounding a broken or hurting relationship. Maybe it's rising up in some kind of frustrating job situation. Maybe it's in a situation with one of your kids, or maybe it's even here in this church community. There is a uneasy feeling that comes with uncertainty, a sense that all is not as it should be, a sense that there are pieces outside of our control. And listen, none of us like that. And in fact, so much of our lives is spent 
working to ensure that we don't even encounter uncertainty or that we can remove that uneasy feeling that comes with uncertainty. Some of us, what we do in the face of uncertainty is we seek control. Isn't that what we do? We seek control and we try to gather information and data because we want to try to control the circumstance so it no longer is uncertain. And others of us, we don't seek control, but what we seek is we seek comfort. And we try, to, we try to numb that uneasy feeling, whether it be by diving into work or a hobby or spending money we don't have on things we don't need, or maybe it's that extra glass or two or three of wine at night, all because of uncertainty, all because of uncertainty. We are deeply uneasy with uncertainty, and we will do almost anything in our power to avoid it. But listen. Listen, Arbor, to this. Oftentimes, it's in seasons of deep uncertainty brought about through times of adversity where God does his most powerful work in us and through us. It's in times of uncertainty brought about through adversity where God does his most powerful work in us and through us. And so if you have your Bibles, get those out and turn to 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 7 through 11 is where we're going to be this morning, and I hope that we see this reality there. This is the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to the church in Corinth, and he writes this. He says, and our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you share in our sufferings, so also you will share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, regarding the affliction that happened to us in the province of Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of living. Indeed, we felt as if the sentence of death had been passed against us. Let's stop there. Can we all agree that is some heavy, heavy language from the Apostle Paul right there? That is some heavy language. And so what's going on here? What is Paul writing to? What's going on in Paul's life? Here's what's happening. Paul is essentially providing some pastoral counsel to the church in Corinth. But a little history on Paul's relationship with the church in Corinth. Many, many years before this letter was written, Paul traveled on one of his missionary journeys to this city of Corinth, and he preached the gospel to a small group of people, and by the grace of God, these people placed their faith in Jesus, all right? They placed their faith in Jesus. They started to meet together. They started to follow the way of Jesus. The only problem was, while they had become Christians, they were still very much Corinthians, And the thing about Corinthians is they were wild, they partied, there was a whole bunch about their culture that was still embedded in their Christian community. They were battling against their old self, they were going after this new self that Christ had created in them, and there was this battle between those two things. And so as a result, there was division, there was infighting, there was disunity, they mistreated the poor, there were all sorts of problems going on. And so that's why Paul wrote that letter that we call 1 Corinthians to them. He's like, you guys are jacked up. You guys have some serious problems going on here. And so he writes this letter to them. He corrects all those things. And by the grace of God, the Corinthians start to press forward and more faithfully obey Jesus Christ. And they start to, they start to get rid of the old self and move into this new way of Jesus. But there's a problem. They're still suffering. They're still undergoing adversity. And and so they write to Paul, they reach out to Paul, and they say, listen, there are these leaders coming into our community, and they're disrupting our community, and they're trying to discredit you. And for the very first time, so many of these people in Corinth were actually experiencing persecution for their faith. And they're like, Paul, what's going on? We thought that when we started to faithfully follow Jesus, we would leave these things behind. This isn't what we signed up for. And what Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians is, is, is no. This is exactly what you signed up for. I think what the Spirit is telling us this morning is this is exactly what we signed up for. Adversity and uncertainty go hand in hand with following Jesus. Adversity and uncertainty go hand in hand with following Jesus. Maybe another way that will be helpful for you to understand that is adversity and uncertainty, they're features, not bugs. 
They're part of the program. They're part of the plan, part of the process. And this is what Paul says in verse eight. After he acknowledges the Corinthians that they're suffering, again, look there again, he says, for we do not want you to be unaware. We don't want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters, regarding the affliction of what happened to us in Asia. And what kind of suffering was it? Let's look at that again. Paul says that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of living. Indeed, we felt as if the sentence of death had been passed against us. And so Paul's like, listen, I hear your suffering. I hear your adversity. I hear your hardship. I get it. Listen, I am there too. And I'm the apostle Paul. I've been following Jesus for some time. And it's not like we get to some level as Christians and things even out and we don't have to deal with this sense of adversity. No, listen, I, the Apostle Paul, am going through something so difficult right now that even I despaired of living. C.S. Lewis, you ever hear of him? You know that guy? He writes this. He says, we were promised sufferings. They were part of the program. We were even told, blessed are they that mourn, and, and I accept it. I've got nothing that I hadn't bargained for. Of course, it is different when the thing happens to oneself, not to others, and in reality, not in imagination. I love that last part, right? It's one thing to intellectualize or theologize about suffering and adversity and uncertainty, it, it, it's another thing to, to watch it happen to the people around you. It's a whole nother thing when it happens to you, right? When adversity, when suffering, when uncertainty just kind of hits you like a two by four upside the head and you're just like, no amount of practice, no amount of discussion could prepare me for this, for the sense that I am despairing of living. And I understand that for many of you in this church, this is what it felt like to be your church a couple years ago going through COVID, going through the, the, the disunity and difficulty that all of that was. And then at the end of that year, hoping and praying that, hey, in 2021, things are gonna turn a corner and things are gonna start to look different, and yet they, they didn't. To call a spade a spade, you suffered great hurt and disappointment at the hand of your leader. And I know that many of you during that season despaired of living. It felt like the sentence of death had been passed against us, against this church, against Arbor. And you thought to yourselves, hey, we're done. There's no chance. There's no way forward. There's no hope. And I can only imagine the levels of uncertainty that permeated this place. I wanna to say to you in this moment that I think I get it. I think I understand what that feels like. Because a little over a year ago, my wife Carrie and I, we were serving in, in a church that we had been serving in for nearly half a decade. Serving alongside people that we loved, that we still love. Our roles, they fit us so well, they fit us almost perfectly. Our kids loved it there. Our kids had friends. We thought that we were going to be there for the rest of our lives. But some issues started to rise up in that church, and rather than ignore those things, we chose to speak truth into that, and let me just tell you, it did not go well. And within a month, a half, month and a half of having those conversations, my wife chose to step down from her role, and after a month and a half after that, I was asked to step down from my role. In fact, today is the exact one-year anniversary I was asked to step away on the date. And you have to understand that, that entering into that season, that was tremendously difficult for me. Do we have any people pleasers here today? Just raise your hand. Be bold, people pleasers. <laughs> I am such a people pleaser, especially when it comes to like speaking truth into like someone who's above me and who was a great friend of mine. And I was so afraid of what was going to happen and exactly what I was afraid of gonna, what was gonna happen, that happened. That is exactly what happened. And in the aftermath of all of it, in the weeks and in the months after all of that unfolded, my wife Carrie and I, we were just, we didn't know what to do. We, we wondered and we, we worried and we thought, God, was there any way that we could have handled that better? Was there any way that we could have moved forward in that differently? And God, what are you doing right now? And there was so much uncertainty that we faced. It felt like the sentence of death had been passed against us. Do you know that feeling? 
Have you experienced that? Maybe you're going through that right now. The sense where everything just kind of seems to be too much to bear. Seems too difficult. Adversity, suffering, uncertainty. They're part of the program. They go hand in hand with following Jesus, but we need to know this, that even though we go through those hardships, even though we've gone through mutual seasons of suffering, let me tell you this, it is not without a purpose. There is purpose and there is meaning behind it. Tim Keller, he's a pastor in New York City, he puts it this way. He says that Christianity teaches that contra fatalism, suffering is overwhelming. Contra Buddhism, suffering is real. Contra karma, suffering is often unfair. And now listen, this is key. Contra secularism, suffering is meaningful. There is purpose to it. And if faced rightly, it can drive us like a nail into the love of God and into more stability and spiritual power than you can imagine. And so, Arbor, I believe that the suffering, the uncertainty, the adversity we faced, that God has a plan and a purpose for it, and he's going to use it in powerful ways in our midst. I believe that. I believe that by faith, that there is value to the deep levels of uncertainty that adversity ushers into our otherwise quite comfortable lives. And this is what the Apostle Paul gets at. He writes this, look at verse nine now. He says this, he says, we go through the hardships and the pain and the uncertainty. God providentially uses this so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in a God who raises the dead. He delivered us from so great a risk of death and he will deliver us. We have set our hope on him that he will deliver us yet again. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God can use the darkest seasons of your life Suffering, unimaginable, adversity, uncertainty. Do you believe that God can use all of that in moments of our lives to free us from the poisonous power of dependence on ourselves? Because he can. God uses our lowest points to liberate us from dependence on ourselves. And that is such a gift. God uses our lowest points to liberate us from dependence on ourselves. And it is truly a gift, the control some of us clamor for and we seek for amidst deep uncertainty. He frees us from that. And and, and the comfort some of us seek to to numb ourselves from the chaos that swirls us, swirls around us, God, God frees us from that. And we find comfort in him. The adversity we face and the uncertainty that comes with it, God takes that and he uses it so that we would not trust in ourselves, but we would trust in God. So that we would trust in God, but not just any kind of God. What kind of God does Paul point us to here? What kind of God does Paul point us to? What does it say? A God who what? Raises the dead. The God we have the privilege of setting our hope in is the God of resurrection life. That means he's a God who can take any circumstance, any situation, and he can breathe new resurrection life into it. That means our God can take any situation that man or the enemy intended for evil, and he can use it for our good. And we see this throughout the scriptures, don't we? Abraham and Sarah, barren and old, right? And what does God do through them? A seemingly uncertain, hopeless situation. He births a people through them. Joseph, imprisoned unjustly. What does God do through him? A hopeless situation. He preserves a people, doesn't he? Moses, this man who was a doubting, ill-equipped leader for the people of God, what does he do through Moses? He delivers a people through him. This is how God works, God takes hopeless situations and breathes new life into them. That's what God does. And perhaps most powerfully, we see this in the life of Jesus. God of gods, king of kings, Lord of lords, 
the one who enjoyed the perfection of heaven and the certainty that goes with it, he chose to enter into our brokenness and our chaos and the uncertainty of this world. And he came here and he bound himself to our human nature. And although he was the king of the heavens and this earth, he did not take the form of a king here and all the certainty and privilege and power that come with it. He took on the form of a servant, didn't he? One of my favorite authors is this writer. Her name's Flannery O'Connor. And uh, she's mostly known for her short stories, but she wrote this book called The Violent Bear It Away. And in this book, there's this young girl, and her name's Lucette. And her parents are missionaries, and she uh, is in this little congregation, and she begins to preach this message about this Jesus and about how God sent Jesus to be king over this world. But when Jesus came, no one recognized him. And she preaches this, listen. She says that when Jesus came, he came on cold straw, warmed by the breath of an ox, and the world said, who is this? Who is this cold blue child? And this mother, plain as winter, the world could not see how the word of God could be as cold as wind or plain as winter. Where is the summer will of God, the world demands? Where are the green seasons of God's will? Where's the spring? Where's the summer? Where's the electric blanket? So they rejected this word and nailed him to the cross and ran a spear through his side. When this Jesus came to dwell with us, he didn't choose the protection of certainty. When this Jesus came, he didn't choose to avoid, uns- to, to avoid adversity. He chose to hunger like we hunger. He chose to hurt like we hurt. He chose to to face uncertainty like we face uncertainty. He chose to suffer like we suffer. In fact, he suffered far more than any of us have ever suffered because he faced all the evil the world could throw against him and he faced it uh, unjustly, this Jesus. He suffered to the point of death, even death on a cross, but why would he do it? Why would Jesus leave the certainty and perfection of heaven and quite literally have the sentence of death placed against him? Why would he do it? Well, again, we have to remember who this God is. He is not just any God. He is the God of resurrection life. He is the God who can take any evil, any evil circumstance and use it for our good and his glory. And no amount of evil could hold this Jesus. No tomb could keep this Jesus. Once and for all, he defeated death. He defeated sin. He overcame adversity. He vanquished all uncertainty. And the greatest news is, anyone who believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth that this Jesus who came in humility is our King and Redeemer, they are brought into this family of God. Not because of anything we've done. We are brought in by the grace of God And listen, with that, we no longer have to fear uncertainty. We no longer have to cower in the face of adversity. This Jesus is our hope. This Jesus is our hope, Arbor. And out of our moments and seasons of hurt and despair, we can confidently forget what lies behind and press forward to what lies ahead because of this Jesus. Not not because we've got a game plan moving forward, but because Jesus is our hope. Even, especially when the the heat of our hardships seems too much to, to bear. But when we despair of living, when it feels like we have the sentence of death against us, we must place our hope in him. He is using our suffering. And listen, he's not only using it, would we be comforted by this? Tim Keller puts it this way, that suffering can refine us rather than destroy us because God himself walks with us in the fire. Listen, he's not just using it. He's with us in it. He's with us in it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. Why? Because he's with us. He is with us, and if we doubt that he is with us, we have to only look at the scars in his hands and his feet and his side to know that he has been with us the entire time. He is with us, and as difficult as it may be at times, listen, it's it's such a gift. 
It's such a gift to look at Jesus and release our desire for control in the face of uncertainty. It's such a gift to find comfort in this Jesus in the face of uncertainty. Look now at verse 11. Look what Paul writes here. Paul writes, as you also join in helping us by prayer so that many people may give thanks to God on our behalf for the gracious gift given to us through the help of many. And so listen, the the benefit, the value of uncertainty and suffering, all the things that are uncomfortable that we want absolutely nothing to do with, they drive us individually, but not just individually, as a community toward greater dependence on God. And, and, And we might have to ask ourselves, what does that trust, what does that dependence look like? How do we know we're doing that? Well, Paul says right here, we know that we are expressing our dependence on God through trust. We trust through prayer. Look at verse 11. As you also join us in helping by prayer. Jerry Bridges, he writes this in his book, Trusting God, that prayer is the most tangible expression of trust in God. That's when we express our trust in God. But here's the insidious thing about being like a human being. We can even use something as good of a gift as prayer, and we can use it to our own advantage and manipulate it. Like when we pray, we are not expressing trust in God as we try to quote unquote manipulate God and get him to do what we want. Because sometimes at the heart of our prayers, that's what's going on, isn't it? But, but also what's true is the flip side of that when we seek out prayer simply as just a means to try to find simple comfort. I don't wanna worry about this, God. This is all on your shoulders now. Listen, either side of that coin, we are still seeking those same things, control or comfort. So what does prayer look like when it's authentically expressing trust in God? Well, I love the way that Eugene Peterson puts it, and I think he gets really close to this sort of mysterious heart of prayer when he says this. He says, we enter into the action begun by another, our creating and saving Lord, and find ourselves participating in the results of the action. We neither do it nor have it done to us, We will to participate in what is willed. We neither manipulate God or are manipulated by God. We are involved in the action and participate in its results, but do not control or define it. That's deep stuff right there, isn't it? But that's what authentic prayer, I think, is. It is this this moment when we come to God, when we are at the end of ourselves and we face an uncertain circumstance and we say, God, I can't, I can't control this. I need you to take this. But as we give that to the Lord, we acknowledge that we are joining him in work that he has already begun. God has been at work amidst our circumstances before we acknowledge him. And we join him and take comfort in joining God who is at work for our good and for his glory. And so Arbor Can I just encourage all of you today, especially those of you whose hearts are weighed down with uncertainty or you're facing some kind of adverse situation right now, can I just encourage you with one simple word, pray? Can I encourage you to pray, to go to God? And maybe you're in a spot where you're like, I don't even have the strength to pray. Can I I ask you to grab someone after the service and have them pray for you? Oftentimes what we need when we can't get the wheels of our faith going is someone else to push us along, right? Have someone pray for you. And Arbor, as a church, I understand that as we enter this new season and there is hope and there is excitement, there is some uncertainty. Can I encourage us toward an end here? Can I encourage us to pray? Can we be praying? Pray for this church. Pray for this body. When our heart wants to worry, can we be a people who pray first? When our mind wants to figure it out and, and get all the planning done, can, can we be a people who pray first? Can we do that? When we want to talk it out and discuss it with a friend and figure out the problem, can we do something first? Can we pray? Can we pray first? Because prayer is the most tangible expression that we are placing our trust in God and not ourselves. A sign that we're doing that is we are becoming more and more a praying people. And so finally, let's wrap it up with this. Suffering, adversity, used by God. Paul says, so that our dependence would not be in ourselves, but would be in God. And then there's another so that. 
He says this, so that, verse 11, many people may give thanks to God on our behalf for the gracious gift given to us through the help of many. And so here's what I think Paul is getting at at the very end of this passage. Here, here's what Paul is driving at right now. Paul is saying, yes, suffering, it, 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 God is using it to drive us into deeper dependence on him, but that's not all God is doing. By the grace of God, he is doing that, and it's incredible, but that's not all he is doing. What God is doing by his grace is he's using that season of our lives, driving us into greater dependence on him, so that, so that many people might give thanks. Our neighbors, our coworkers, the barista, the person who cuts your hair, whoever would be able to see the goodness of God tangibly show up in your life and enter into a relationship with the God of resurrection life. Arbor, a few weeks ago, um, I was up here and I just said a few words and, and I shared with you that I don't view myself as some kind of grand visionary type with all the answers. And I wanna expand on that a little bit because, because I believe that to be true and, and I, here, here's my problem with that word vision. Oftentimes, I think it's misused when someone brings that up because what they're trying to do, I think, is they're trying to leverage that word and that idea in order to implicitly create certainty and control where I don't think we as, as a people of God, as we journey forth in our faith, were ever meant to have. No, 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 don't get me wrong. I have hopes and I have dreams and I have a vision for what we as a people of God would be that we would passionately pursue our mission to help others find and follow Jesus Christ. But listen, that we wouldn't do that under the banner of some kind of contrived man-made vision, but that we would do that where we're at in our lives right now, that we would come out of our mutual seasons of adversity and that we would place our dependence in Jesus Christ and that people would see that and they would come to faith, that they would enter into a relationship with the God of resurrection life. Because honestly, over the last two years, I don't think people in Woodenville or people in the surrounding area, I don't think the thing that they're looking for is a community that has it all figured out. I, I don't think they're looking and being like, wow, they have unparalleled certainty in what they're doing. Wow, they're such an admirable people, you know? I don't want people to see some huge plan that we have and be like, wow, Arbor is great. I want people to see a humble people who truly trust in God and be like, wow, Jesus is great. That's what I want people to see. And I believe that as we continue to press on and press our hope into this Jesus, into this God who raises the dead, that he will deliver us. As Paul says at the end of that letter, that this is a God who has delivered us before and he will deliver us again. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your kindness to us. That you would reach out to us in our uncertainty, that you would reach out to us in our brokenness and in our chaos, and that you would do that by joining us, by becoming like us, and so we thank you for Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you hurt like we hurt, that, we, that you suffer like we suffer, and we place our trust in you. Lord, you see our hurt, you see our pain. And in this room, you see the different stories of, of hurt and adversity and uncertainty right now. You see the individual who's, who's struggling to figure out how they're going to get the bills paid. You see the individual whose relationship is, is, is hurting God. You, you see all of it, Lord. And in your power and in your providence, you're, you're, you're using that. Would you help us, God, as a people, press into you, place our hope and our trust in you? When things get uncertain, would we not turn into ourselves, but would we turn to you, God, and place our hope in you. Strengthen us, Holy Spirit, as we press forward from this place, and would you bless us as a people? Would you show your favor on us, God, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.